Welcome to the Dr. Bundy Podcast. I couldn't be more excited to have, uh, you know, someone who I'm a fan of. You know, growing up in New York, I used to see you on NBC, Dr. Ian Smith, who, um, listen, you're, I think you were a celebrity doctor before Dr. Oz was even on the scene there, from what I, from what I can remember. <laughs> but for folks who don't know who you are, um, your, I mean, your resume is, is endless. You're like a, you know, a many times over New York Times bestselling author. You're obviously a TV personality. I think currently you're co-hosting the Rachel Ray Show. Um, but you've been, you were on the original cast of crew of The Doctors, right? Was it the original cohort of Docs? Uh, I was the second second iteration, The Doctors, Celebrity Fit Club. Yeah, yeah Celebrity Fit Club on VH1, which is, you know, we're dating ourselves, you know. Um, but, yeah. but everywhere, The View, Oprah, I mean, you name it, you've been on it. Um, I actually knew you as an NBC correspondent growing up in New York. I used to see you on TV all the time yeah, in a local NBC affiliate. So... You know, it's just such a pleasure to have you here, man. You know, when I was telling folks that I was going to be speaking to you, uh, I, a lot of folks were excited, man. They're like, wow, man. You know, they're really your <laughs> story. So I, I thank you so much for your time, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Wow, I don't, I don't, I don't feel old, but the way you make it sound like I've been around for a while, I guess I have been. You know, Mehmet, before he became on TV, I used to interview Mehmet up at Columbia. So I was on TV long before Mehmet was, and uh, he was doing a cardiothoracic surgery. So I'd go up to Columbia in the Upper West Side, and I interview him for stories when I was just a little medical reporter. Uh, it's funny, Sanjay uh, Gupta from CNN, um, you know, he and I met at a, a People Magazine party back in the city. And um, a funny little story, he probably doesn't even know this, but CNN had called my agent and asked me would I be willing to be their chief medical correspondent. And uh, I said, that doesn't sound too bad, but then I had to live in Atlanta. <laughs> And I love New York, <laughs> yeah. so I didn't want to leave New York. So uh, uh, Sanjay, uh, great for him. Sanjay uh, got the gig, uh, but uh, yeah, I've been around for a few minutes. <laughs> hey, man, that's good, man. You have a quite, quite a legacy, man, behind you. Um, so like I was telling you, you know, this podcast is really about your journey, your story. We're going to talk about all the stuff that you do, because obviously you're a huge, um, you know, just in terms of, of weight loss and motivating people to, to be them best sel- be their best selves in fitness and nutrition. You're obviously like, you know, one of the biggest figures, I would say, on that platform. But, uh, you know, just to kind of like hear a little bit about your story, just for the, you know, the high school kids and, you know, the folks that want to become a doctor and they see you and they really idolize you. Um, you know, just what I know about you is just your basic stuff that, I would, that anyone can read on the website, but we're going to dive into a little bit. You know, I know you grew up in Connecticut. You went to Harvard, so you know, got, 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 got some super smarts there. You had a master's degree from Columbia, and then you went to med school, started at Dartmouth, and you ended up in your med school years at the University of Chicago. Um, did, you, did you do a residency after that? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did a residency at Sinai. Uh, well, I start, well, let's back up for a second. First of all, I grew up in a small town in Connecticut, uh, single mom. And, um, you know, I was very blessed. We were not um, economically wealthy, uh, but we were wealthy as far as love and encouragement and support. So my family always supported me to, you know, strive for the best I could be and do the best. Academics were number one in my household. Uh, It was our ticket out. um, And it was a way to level the playing field. Uh, I also was a huge athlete. Uh, as a kid, I played all the sports, loved sports, still I'm a big sportsman. So, you know, medicine was always a first love of mine, as was, you know, academics and um, sports. So I had all these interests as a kid. I've always been a multi-interest um, type person. You know, I never just liked one thing. You know, yeah, I wanted to be a doctor, but I also, you know, I wanted to be an author and be a writer. Uh, I still have aspirations to maybe be an actor. Uh, you know, I just like things and, uh, I like to try new things. I like to challenge myself. So, you know, I went to, um, I went to Harvard undergrad, get my master's in science education at Columbia. Then went to Dartmouth for my first two years up in New Hampshire where I learned how to ski. Uh, so great, great ski country up there in the white mountains. It was an awesome experience for a kid like me, uh, you know, who had not been in that kind of rural secluded environment before, but I learned a lot about life, about myself, about other people. It was really, really a great experience. Uh, And I still look fondly back on those two years I spent at Dartmouth up in the mountains. Uh, And then I decided that I wanted, really, I'm a city type kid. I really wanted to um, have more experience uh, with urban medicine, per se. And while uh, Dartmouth is wonderful and Dartmouth Hitchcock, which is the hospital, is beautiful, is brand new when I was up there, I just felt like I wouldn't be able to see the kind of cases and patients 
that I wanted to see in my career. So I was lucky, who knew at the time how difficult it was, but I was lucky to have transferred to the University of Chicago, Pritzker School of Medicine. Uh, transfers in medical school are like hitting the lottery, by the way. I didn't know that at the time because um, I kind of just did things I wanted to try to do. I, I was never afraid to try stuff. So even though there were big odds, it wouldn't have phased me anyway. Uh, and they accepted my transfer. So I went to U of C. Um, for your third and uh, for your clinical years? Mm -hmm. Yes, my last two years. Yep, yep. For rotations, and uh, finished up at U of C, and then I matched in orthopedic surgery uh, in New York at uh, Montefiore. Actually, that's how I started. Um, but what was interesting was I'd always been a news junkie. Uh, I loved the news, and uh, and I just always wanted to learn how do they make news? Like how do they make stories? How do they write stories? How do they decide what to cover? So when I was a fourth year med student, the, the second half of fourth year, where, as you know, is much easier, all the hard stuff's out the way, waiting for the match, um, I decided to do an internship at NBC in Chicago. I met this uh, anchor, this morning anchor I'd see every morning um, before I went to the class, med school class, um, and I would see him. And I met him at a charity event, a gala. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, had invited me to her dad's her dad's company was sponsoring this gala in conjunction with NBC. And this anchor who I always watched was there. And I just walked up to him and said, hey, I want to be your intern, just like that. <laughs> and uh, this was back in the day. And he said, sure, come on down to the station. That's when you can do that, right? No bureaucracy, no paperwork. Come on down to the station next week. So next week, I showed up at the station and became this guy's intern for about six months. Wow. and learned about the news business. I still really had no intention on being on the news. I just figured before I started my internship and I was going to get killed as a surgical intern, I should do something that I may never have the chance to do again. And I wanted to see a newsroom. And, you know, that led to me graduating, matching, and then becoming an, a reporter at NBC in New York while I was doing my residency. Oh, Wow. Man, that's a whole nother podcast of what I went through to try to do both of those things. And once again, when you're young and fearless uh, and you don't think about odds, you can do so much. And I did so much stuff that had I thought about it or I had been older like I am now and thought about it. I would have said, there's no way this guy's going to be able to do all this stuff, but I could care less. So I did that. Then I started writing a column for the New York Daily News while I was on NBC, while I was a resident. Wow. <laughs> then... I started writing for Time Magazine. I had my own column in Time Magazine. So I just kind of went creatively crazy in a good way. I did whatever I wanted to do. Um, long story, already too long, but to finish it. And so I finished up doing a rehab residency in physiatry because surgery and my job on the news, they weren't melding, you know. Mm -hmm. I tried, but the uh, orthopedic wasn't, ortho wasn't working with, um, my TV career. So I did a rehab um, and finished up the rehab residency. And um, I've had a great experience. I always wanted to be in the OR. I love the OR. I miss the OR today. There's something about the OR that I always loved. But I got to tell you, my career as a medical journalist and as a public health advocate has been extremely rewarding. And uh, I wouldn't change it for anything. Wow, that's amazing, man. I, there's, so many, there's so many things I'm gonna, I got to pick out of that story, man. <laughs> so one is, how did you get the gig working for the Daily News and for Time Magazine? So part of what I always tell young people and people in general is, you know, you just, it's just not good enough to dream. You just got to believe in yourself that you can go do it and go try get it. And so I just said, listen, I'd love to write a column in a magazine. I'm, you know, I, I always loved being a writer in college. Um, and one of my favorite courses at Harvard was a writing course. And um, I was at this, um, this journalistic convention called NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists. I was young, geez. Um, and I walked up to the job fair and um, I decided I wanted to write for the New York Daily News. And uh, so I found some daily news reporters and said, hey, I could write for you guys. <laughs> I'd never written a column in my life. And they said, you can? I was like, yeah, I work up for NBC, blah, blah, blah. Next thing I know, they called me into the office and said, hey, let's go give you a shot. And they gave me a shot, and I wrote that column for years. It was a great column. I loved it. It was called The Smith Report. <laughs> Very original. <laughs> uh, but then I wanted to be in the glossy, so I wanted to be in a magazine. 
And so I was at NABJ one year at that conference. Journal, every year, this uh, journalist association has this conference. I went to the job fair and I looked to my right and there was Newsweek. I looked to my left, there was Time Magazine. And there were a lot of people around the Newsweek uh, tables. So I just went to Time Magazine. And uh, I walked up, I had this uh, little book of clippings from my, uh, my column for the New York Daily News that I brought with me. I walked up, there was an unassuming guy uh, standing there, uh, you know, a little short white guy. And um, I said to him, hey, I'm Dr. Ian Smith. I'd love to write for you guys. He goes, you would? I was like, yeah. And so I showed him my little clippings and uh, we got to talking. He went to Harvard, I went to Harvard. So we had that nice little connection. And he said, hey, when we get back to New York, come across the street, because Time Magazine at the time, Time Life Building was across the street from 30 Rockefeller Plaza. He said, hey, come across the street. Let me introduce you to our health section, the editor, and see if we can do something with you. Two weeks later, they hired me to be have my own column in the magazine. What a wonderful, heady experience. I mean, I think back at it now, it was just, it was so amazing. I, I just had so much fun early in my career doing things that were out of the box and creative and and while I was doing medicine in a way, it wasn't the humdrum nine to five or whatever, clinical in the hospital, clinics. It just was a different life and I enjoyed it. It was exciting. It was exciting. I can imagine, man. I mean, it sounds, just hearing about it is, is exciting. <laughs> so when you finished your residency, was there a time where you practiced or were you like, you know what? I'm like, this media stuff is really taking off. Were you just offered a job at like NBC? Why don't you just work for us now or? Yeah, the, the, the media thing just went crazy. Um, then they hired me at the network uh, to be a network correspondent for the Today Show with Nightly News. And I just said, listen, you know, I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I feel like I'm built for this. Uh, every day was a new experience for me. And while I said I still missed seeing patients, I still missed the OR and different aspects of that. But I just I had to make a decision. And I just felt like from a long term standpoint, I, my passion was to do medicine, but not in the traditional way of doing medicine. And so I started working at NBC full time. Like right out of residency, you segued right in. Right out of residency. They hired me right away after I finished. Boom. That's awesome. Man. That's such an amazing story. Um, yeah, it's different. Different story. It's a totally different path than any other doctor that I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of, I guess, you know, being an orthopedic surgical, I guess, intern, you probably did, you know, some of your residency in orthopedic surgery, then you did, you know, physical medicine and rehab, all sorts of sporty, like, you know, fields, like, you know, really dealing with, like, optimizing performance, uh, helping people recover from injuries, to live, like, an active, fulfilled life. What you know, really, the bulk of the stuff that you write is related to optimizing wellness, optimizing health. Uh, you know, a lot of weight loss stuff, um, even a lot of the stuff that you've done, like you know, out beyond NBC, you know, like uh, Celebrity Fit Club, and you know, I mean, just tons of stuff. You were on the, also part of the Obama team, you know, uh, on his task force for fitness and nutrition. Um, what is that all inspired by? your residency stuff or is that just sort of a linear you know from your youth being a, an athlete as as a youngster and you know kind of is that what inspired all of that or did you have a personal transformation where you got out of shape and they got back into shape like what really motivated motivates that because it seems like it's such a bulk of what, what you do um, in terms of what you write and what you what you stand for yeah you know i gotta tell you i think it's all just you know you tend to gravitate what's natural for you in life you know and for me, sports has always been a center. Sports has always meant so much to me. Uh, it's taught me about work ethic. It's taught me about competition. It's taught me about how to lose, how to win. It's just taught me, it's just such a microcosm of life. And so it was natural for me to want to be around uh, sports related issues. Um, I really fell into the whole weight loss game because, and you know, back in the day, medical school, we had no no nutrition courses whatsoever. I mean, I don't know about you, but we had half a day, uh, we had a GI doc come in and teach us about food and GI issues. And the only reason why we even went to that lecture was because they were serving food. You know, we were, you know, we're poor medical students and it was like, we got a free lunch out of this thing. So that was like, you know, a big magnet for us, but that was it. You know, no one knew what a calorie was, where to get certain vitamins and nutrients and no one knew any of that stuff when I was in med school. I had to teach myself all that stuff after medical school. Now I hear there's more 
of that, but it's still not as robust as it probably should be. But what had happened was when I was writing a, a, my column for Time Magazine, I also wanted to write books. And I had tried to write a mystery uh, a long time ago when I was getting my master's. And um, I had an agent, a literary agent, which was hard to get. I didn't know that at the time either. Um, you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss, by the way, <laughs> because sometimes in life, if you really understand the difficulty of something, it can actually overwhelm you. It can discourage you. And I didn't find anything difficult, not because I was great, but because I said, oh, why not? You know, that's what kind of my attitude. Try it, you know? Anyway, I procured this agent, literary agent, tried to sell this book, my first book that I wrote, uh, which, by the way, I since published, uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. But, uh, and we couldn't really, we got some takers and they, some of the publishers wanted to rework the story, but then I went to med school. So I, you know, cause it was my gap year in between um, college and med school. I took the year off and got my master's in Columbia. So I tried, I was living in New York. I was trying to do all that stuff that I could. And then I went to Dartmouth. So all the kind of stuff, other stuff I had going on, obviously, you know, first year of medical school, you can't have any side hustles, you know? Mm -hmm. So that went away, but, so I never got a chance to write that book. Then I got an email from an editor from Random House who's, who she said, her name was Mary Barr, I'll never forget it. She said, I love the column you write for Time Magazine. Would you ever want to write a book? Holy cow, are you kidding? Yeah, I want to write a book. And uh, so we met um, and uh, we had a nice lunch. Uh, it was my first meeting of an editor of a major publishing. It was so awesome for me. And um, I said, what do you want, what should I write? She goes, you can write whatever you want. That's how good we, we think your writing is like, wow. So I chose two books. One book was uh, really wonky, was about how to search the internet and find credible uh, websites. It was called, uh, I don't know if I have one right here, but it was called uh, Dr. Ian Smith's Guide to Medical Websites. <laughs> and then, um, then I said, well, I wanna write a diet book because when I write my column for Time Magazine, so many people have diet questions. You know, I may write about Tylenol uh, or the flu, and my email box was full of diet questions, fat burners, metabolism, all this stuff. And so I said, I'd like to really write the truth about it. And so she, they said, sure, go ahead. And so my first diet book was a book that I thought was so amazing. <laughs> it was called The Take Control Diet. It sold like two copies. <laughs> And I just, and here I was like, oh, this is great. It's got great information. I'm going to teach you about calories and nutrition and blah, blah, blah. Didn't sell a lick. Um, and, but I learned a lot from that book. And what I learned was that you have to meet people where they are. Okay. You can't speak to people from above, from a tower. You got to work with people, meet them where they are. And that book, I wasn't speaking down to people, but I was trying to educate you. This is what you need to know about macronutrients and this and that. And people just want to lose weight. They, and so when I was doing Celebrity Fit Club, uh, what happened was I was the diet expert on that show, as you know, and I gave all the celebrities the take control diet. And after about week two on the show, the celebrities came to me and said, Dr. Ian, we were in LA, I'm set. They said, Dr. Ian, we love you. But listen, this book is too much for us. Just tell us what to eat and when to eat it. That's all we want to know. And I was like, after I was obviously hurt, okay, because I'm like, geez, like, this is a, I thought this book was going to be so helpful to them. Then I realized, okay, fine. You want to know what to eat, when to eat it? I can do that very easily. And that's when I wrote The Fat Smash Diet. And it didn't start off as a book. Every week, back in the day, we would fax. I'd fax into the production office in LA. I, I was living in New York at the time, so I would fly out every week. But I would fax to the production office a new diet plan for the week they would then send it to the celebrities to follow that week. And after the season was over, I had enough weeks and someone said, why don't you make that a book? I was like, well, because it's not a book. They're like, listen, everyone lost a lot of weight on that program. You can make that a book. And the Fat Smash Diet became my first New York Times mega bestseller. And it was born from those celebrities telling me, tell us what to eat and when to eat and keep it simple. Man, there's so much... <laughs> That was your, there's so much that you said there that's so powerful. So I was just mentioning to you, I just finished my first book called Let's Get It, which is a self-empowerment book and, you know, just kind of like how to hustle and grind your way to achieve goals. And I, I just read your latest book this past weekend, which I loved, um, which we'll talk about. Uh, but you mentioned that story. You mentioned the story about what you just shared with us in your book that I just read. 
and I think there's a couple of things there that really touched me. So, and, and, and really, while I was reading your book, there was like so many like, I was like, wow, there's so many like amazing like little pearls in there. So one is like, one is the value of criticism, right? So when you were saying like you were talking to the celebrities and you're like, you know, from a really heady place and all of this stuff is rooted in science and, you know, really well vetted, well researched, you're like, okay, well, you know, you have this many grams of this and this many grams of that. And this is how you're going to do this. And this is how this is metabolized. That just goes through someone's head. You know, it's like, what? No, I just want to know the facts. Like, what do I eat? What do I exercise? How do I exercise? How do I get it done? Right. And like you said, what you said there was, yeah, at first when you got that criticism, it's like, it hurts a little bit, but really I put so much time into this book, you know, but it made winners win winners find a way to win you made a lateral move and not intentionally but you didn't give up and you actually created a, a new york times bestseller essentially out of that criticism that you received more or less that's one which i love um and two is when your book failed that initial book when it didn't sell very many copies you know it's also kind of like you got to fail your way to success like you're a hugely successful uh, writer. You've written, I think, five New York Times best-selling books. Um, you know, you're you've written I don't know how many books. I mean, a, a, a gajillion, eighteen, eighteen books. I mean, that's incredible. Um, and you didn't give up. Like, you know, it, it's a lot. It's very easy. You put so much time into writing that first book. It's very easy for someone to just fold at that point. Be like, you know what? I put so much into this, and you know what? And, and it didn't work out the way I intended it to work out. And it's such an amazing book. But no, you actually, you know rose from the failure of well, it probably wasn't a failure but you rose from what you didn't expect as you didn't expect no, it was a failure and i and, you know and that's such a valuable lesson because anyone who's achieved the level of the success that you've achieved has failed many times you know it's not this like linear path to greatness and you know the other thing is the greatness isn't a plateau it's not like you hit that first best-selling book you're like all right cool done you know no you written you've written many books thereafter it's like you know you're always trying to set the bar higher. I mean, that's what, again, that's like a winner's mindset where you're not existing on a plateau. You know, you're really trying to push yourself to the next level. And the last thing that I love what you just said, sorry to be talking so much. Um, no, it's okay. No, go ahead. Was speaking to people at their level. And, you know, this is something very valuable that I learned. Well, not at their level, but where they are. Are, right. Well, I mean, where they are. And, like, you know, and, and a lot of that is that there's like an emotional quotient that goes into that, right? Because... You know, and I learned this from practicing medicine. You know, when you first start practicing, you know, you, you, you believe that there's a way a doctor is supposed to be, the way you're supposed to speak to your patients. And then, you know, there's like a certain approach. And the longer that I've been doing this, like, I've, you know, my private practice in New York City, it's, this is the 11th year. And, you know, I'm me now. Like, you know, I, like literally how we're talking, this is how I talk to my patients, you know. And it, it, it's, it almost, it, it demystifies the doctor patient relationship. Like kind of when you were speaking to it demystifies like, okay, you're this fitness and nutrition expert, but yeah, but I feel you, I hear you. I know what you're going through. I understand that. And we're going to work at that where you are right now, you know, and there's a lot of value. You can't really help people unless you can, unless you have the emotional quotient to really recognize where they're coming from you know maybe there's some cultural issues there maybe there's you know there's just so much there man so i'm gonna throw the ball let back. me throw the ball, but yeah let me quickly respond to those three points the first thing i want to say that point one is that billy jean king one of the greatest female tennis players of all time was a friend of mine has a great saying that i love it's very simple champions adjust you go out with a game plan and the game plan's not working your opponent's doing something different a champion will make the adjustment that's what a champion does so for me I had to make the adjustment. The first, that first book was not commercially successful, though I thought it was editorially successful for what I wanted to deliver. That was fine. But commercially, it was not successful. I wanted both. I wanted editorial success. And I wanted commercial success. So I had to make the adjustment. And so, yeah, after you get over yourself, which is you got to learn how to do in life, you get over yourself. Then you figure out, you know, how to win. And so the Fat Smash Diet, which is another story, you don't even want to know the story about how that book became successful because that may be one of the, the most emotional success I've ever had because that book was never meant to win and it became a huge mega sell. That's another time we'll talk about that. That's point one. Point two is that people have to understand that losing or failing really is just a slow way of winning. You have to look at life that way. You know, I had a guy when I was a med student, I'll never get a surgeon, who sat me down and said, Smith, you're never going to make it. Who is this guy? Are you crazy? 
you have no idea who I am, dude. Like, <laughs> you have no idea how tough I am, how resilient I am, how hardworking I am. You have no clue, okay? You picked the wrong guy to mess with. Um, and uh, I wish I could find that guy now, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, but the guy said that to me. He, I was completely unfit. Huh? He knows who you are. <laughs> yeah, I was unfazed. And let me tell you why I was unfazed. I was unfazed because I knew who I was. But here's the sadness. If that guy had picked another med student to say that to, he could have crushed him. If someone had not had the kind of resolve and the determination that I had, where he was like a flea on the back of an elephant, he was nothing to me, but someone else, he could have hurt them deeply. And that really bothered me. I'm like, thank goodness it was me he chose because he was irrelevant to me. Uh, and third, uh, I want to say that people have to understand that, you know, in life, you get curveballs. You get curveballs in life. And it's, I always say, it's not how well you can hit the straight balls, it's how well you hit those curveballs. That is the texture of life, right? If something's easy and right down the middle, anybody can do that. It's when it's up and it's down, and it's left and it's right. How can you hit those balls? And that to me is the measure of someone's success. I love that, man. That's, uh, I love it. Uh, maybe we could segue a little bit into, into the book that you just wrote. Um, so it's, it's, it's called Mind Over Weight. And really the big part of it should be like, yeah, it is, man. There it is. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I love the design and everything of the book, but I, I also love the feel of a book. So the first thing I do when I get a hardcover book is I actually take the cover off. And I just, and I love the color that you chose for like the actual, the actual book itself. It's like that blue. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, and you know, it really, it should be like, you know, it, it, after reading the book, it's like mind, which it should be like, you know, like the whole entire cover and then overweight, you know, because it is a real, it's really a mindset book. And it's about how to set goals, how to set smart goals for yourself, how to set very smart girl goals. And I'll let you talk about, uh, talk about that, uh, which is an acronym actually for how to set goals. And how to get your, and I'm a big believer in this, how to get your daily win. What's the one thing I'm going to do today to get to my long-term goal? You know, what is the one win I'm going to have today? Because it's those small wins over days, weeks, months, years. I mean, I had, I had a fitness transformation, you know, which my trainer, I was like, you know, this soft, flabby guy. This was about eight years ago. And I said, listen, man, I just want to get jacked. I want to be look good with my shirt off, man. That's what I want. He's like, all right, man. <laughs> He saw where I was at, and he's like, it's going to take you three to five years to get there. I was like, all right, let's go. And, you know, it was literally they're getting those workouts in at 4.30 in the morning. Whenever I had to do it, you had to get that one win for the day. Whatever your macros were for that day, you had to get that one win for the day. But it's about setting a goal that's attainable. And, and maybe you could just talk about the very smart goal setting. You know, like I said, the whole – go run through that acronym, man, because I think there's so much yeah. there. Yeah, okay. First of all, let me just say, first of all, this book um, – well – if you're, if you're on Instagram, follow me at Dr. Ian Smith, spell the doctor out, I-A-N Smith. Please now look for the blue check mark because someone else just set up a stupid fan page and is trying to impersonate me. Like who has time for that nonsense? So make sure you're following me. Okay. I get a lot of, I give you a lot of free content. I love giving the content away free despite my editors not liking that, but you know, I love giving stuff away free. Sure. Let me tell you something about this book real fast. So look at the size of this book, right? Look how small it is. So I had a fight for this book, by the way, just so you know this. The, my publisher wanted me to write another diet book. I'm like, geez, I've written 10 diet books. Like, this book is important. This is about the mind. This is an endless book. So we went back and forth about it. So they finally agreed to let me publish it. I kind of like threatened them a little bit, but anyway. Uh, so we they agreed to publish the book. Then I said to them that this book has to be inexpensive. They're like, what are you talking about? I was like, the book has got to be small. It's only seven chapters. And someone has to be able to read this book flying from New York to LA. That was my goal. They're like, oh, geez, like, seriously, like, we don't know if we can do that. You know, we need a certain price point. I said, nope, the price is $19.99. They're like, but your book sell for $26.99. No, 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 $19.99. Because if it's $19.99 on Amazon and BNN, it'll go down to $13.99 after the discount. They always give you like a 30% discount. So we fought about that for two months. So finally they acquiesced and agreed to it. So I just want people to know that this book is very important to me. And if you can't afford to buy Mind Overweight, please go to your library. You can get it free, uh, digital copies for free. Uh, you know, take it out, please. It's not about me selling books, but I think that what's in this book, like your book, I'm sure will do the same thing. This is about life. This is about how do you win in life? 
So for example, you're asking about the goals, right? Um, very smart goals, I call them, right? And so um, very smart, this is the acronym. V is for varied goals. E is for effective. R is for responsible goals. Y is yours. They gotta be your goals, not someone else. The SMART goals, of course, have been around for a while. S is for specific, M is for measurable, A is attainable, uh, R is for relevant, and T is time limited. The reason why this chapter, chapter one is about motivation, by the way, the reason why, which is most important, the reason why chapter two is about goal setting, before I talk about choosing the right plan, is because people set the wrong goals. And I think the reason why so many people fail at weight loss or personal transformation in general is because their goals are wrong. And by that, I mean, it's not someone saying, I want to lose 30 pounds. Okay, that's right. But then how do you break that down? You got to take the big goal and break it down into a smaller goal, small milestone. So I want to lose 30 pounds over what period of time? Well, I want to lose 30 pounds, but I want to lose my 30 pounds over four months. Good. Now let's break that 30 pounds week by week, week one, one pound, week two, two pounds, week three, no pounds. I'm going away that week or I have a busy week. So sometimes even a no loss week is still a victory, right? So this chapter teaches people how to set goals so that they're realistic, that they are attainable. And one thing I've learned from other people is that when you set smaller milestones, a bunch of small milestones, and when you hit one, one milestone makes you more motivated to hit the next one more motivated. So it becomes actually a self-motivating uh, 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 procedure. Now, when we end this though, this podcast, I'd like to read some of my confidence mantras. I'm not going to do them now, but these confidence mantras that are on page 150 to me are important in life. And I want to share some of those before we end, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, let's go right now, man. Let's do it. Let's do it right you want to do it? Do it. Okay. I'm going to pick five of my favorite of these mantras, right? Failure is a great opportunity for me to learn how to be successful. Each small step I take is a step in the direction of my goals. I am talented regardless of what others think or say. I got this from my wife. No matter how bad a day, the clock runs out at 24 hours. And my last one I'll give you is, Success is earned, not given. Let me quick tell you. So my wife, who's also a physician, um, she went to Harvard Med and she was a, an intern and a, 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 she was a, a student, a sub -I. And we were trading war stories as med students and because we've been dating since then, by the way. And she told me how one day she was on the wards and she and her intern were just busting their butts that day. They were getting killed case after case after case, admissions and missions. And the uh, senior resident was just nasty, just totally annihilating them. And they were so tired and hungry and they were just ragged. And the intern turned to her and said, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. No matter how bad they treat us, no matter how tough the day is, one thing they cannot do is they can't stop the clock. And wow, to this day, I get chills because that is so important in life in general. Like, no matter how bad it is, no matter how bad your boss is treating you or your teacher or professor, there's gotta be an end point because they can't stop the clock. The clock will continue to go. That, that's, there's so much value in each one of those things, but I love that story. It also reminds me of like just getting beaten down. I, I'm sure you've read Can't Hurt Me, uh, David Goggins' book. Um, that just reminded me of that. It kind of is like that when you're an intern or a sub -I sometimes, just getting beat up. And you're right, the de bad times and good times end too, you know? Everything comes to an end. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, the, one other thing I just want to touch on because I know I can't. I could talk to you for hours, man. But you know, <laughs> we we'll have to we we'll have to cut this off at some point. But you know, one of the things that I loved in your book was I said, there was one part where it was, you have to love yourself. You know, and mm. you touched on that with one of the five points you, that, that that you mentioned there. And and it's funny because I actually that really hit me hard because. I um I I actually sent a message to someone who's close to me and who's you know been working to you know trying to get into shape and you know it's been sort of like up and down it's been a real struggle and I said I said to her I said you know I don't like the way you talk to yourself 
you know mm. like you have to be kinder to yourself like as kind as you are to all of us around you like as like you know, because you're an incredibly loving person and you know, as kind as you are to me to 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 to, all, to anyone in your world you got to be that kind to yourself and i got that from your book man and you know i thought that was just so well said because you know the self talk that a lot of folks have it's it really is just so stifling and debilitating like oh you suck you're not good enough you can never do that you can you know and and that you know there's a bit of that in all of us but spinning that around into like a positive and saying you know what i'm going to do this i can do this i'm a good friend i'm a beautiful person you know there is such tremendous value in that man you know it really is i'm just like even looking into the mirror in the morning saying you know what i love you i love who i see in the mirror you know and just starting your day like that with a positive affirmation it really just sets the mood the tone for your life you know and then you get these little wins every day and then there you go you achieve your goal you know what? i'm going to tell you something <clears throat> sometimes people mistaken confidence for arrogance or they mistaken loving yourself for selfishness that's not selfish you have to love who you are to your core first before you can love anybody else really if you don't love yourself you really i don't know how good you can be at loving someone else you know what i mean i mean you can love someone else but how good can you really be if you don't love yourself first and i have someone else um uh, a friend of mine who's like who you just said who doesn't who she's not nice to herself and even when i'm giving advice for weight loss i say to people listen here are the guidelines, but listen, don't be so hard on yourself. You have a bad day, you slip up, you mess up, oh, it's okay. Like, this isn't the end of the world. I told my brother one day, I said, nothing is bigger than life. Think about it. No matter how bad of a day you, you how bad, a big a mistake you make, no matter how big of an award you make, you, you get, no matter some prize you win, life is bigger than everything. Because without life, nothing else matters, right? So I tell people all the time, you have to love yourself and be, and be in love with yourself. Like, I love who I am. I don't think I'm the greatest person alive. I don't think I'm perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm always a work in progress, but I love who I am. I try to be a good person. I work very hard. I try to be open-minded. I have a lot of work to look at anybody else, but you still got to love yourself. You know, when I was uh, on my honeymoon, I wrote this book called Happy, Simple Steps to Get the Most Out of Life, right? And the reason I got to send you a copy of this book, the reason why I wrote this book was because when I was on my honeymoon a long time ago and we were staying, we're in Indonesia and we were staying at this resort um, that we could barely afford, by the way, uh, but we're staying at this resort and every night I was on NBC at the time and writing my columns, but every night because we were halfway around the world in order to be connected to New York, I'd have to go to the lodge where the only place that had internet was in the lodge, not in our, our bungalows. I have to go to the lodge at midnight, be able to connect with New York, see what's going on, to tune in and blah, 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 because I, I had to be so connected, so connected. Anyway, so there's a guy who would come pick me up at about midnight, local time, on the back of a golf court, and we drive up the hill and get to the lodge. And it was dark out and a lot of animals, wild animals, so I couldn't go by myself. So this guy would take me. and after like the third night, and he had to wait for me, I do all my internet stuff, and then he drive me back to my bungalow, and I go to sleep. After about the third night, I start talking to this guy, little skinny little guy, and we're talking. And I said, "Hey, have you ever been to New York?" And uh, he's like, "Oh no, never, never, never." I'm like, "You don't want to go to New York? Like it's the greatest city in the world." And he was like, "Yeah, I would love to go to New York, but I'll never go." I said, "Why do you say that? You never go your whole life." He said, "I'll never go. I can't afford it." I said, but you could say, he's like, it's not going to happen, but I'm okay with that. And I was like, wow. I was like, well, how much money do you make? And back then it was like the equivalent of $200 a month that he made. Uh, and he said to me, but I'm okay. I'm happy. I have everything I need. And meanwhile, I'm saying, here I am, this New Yorker. I'm saying $200 a month. This guy is saying he's okay with it, that he doesn't mind. He, that even though he wants to go to New York, he realized he can't go to New York. And then I realized... This guy was happy. This guy had accepted where he was in life. And not that he didn't have ambitions, he was still ambitious, but he was okay if he didn't get all these things, all the things that I thought were important. He was okay without it. He didn't need to have, you know, three computers at his house. His, 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 he's lived in a house where they all shared one computer. So I decided I wanted to write this book, Happiness, because that trip 
taught me about happiness and taught me what it was like when I was out of the maze of New York City, the rat's maze of fast paced action, noise, blah, blah, blah. When I had been removed from it and I was halfway around the world and people moved slower and more thoughtfully, it taught me about what true happiness really was. And so I just want to end by saying that, you know, people have to always be in search of happiness and don't tie your happiness to external validation. That is the worst thing you can possibly do. Be happy because of things internally and things that give you a greater sense of importance and, or a sense of being. That's what happiness is all about. And I think given the time that we're in now with all of this nonsense and chaos about COVID and all of this mismanagement and poor leadership we've had in the country, I think that people need to find their inner happiness. And I think that people need to be confident that there's a lot to live life for and there's a lot they can accomplish but you have to lead inside and you have to have internal peace first and have uh have respect for what is most important in life i don't think there's a better better way to end this podcast man <laughs> um ian thank you i mean i just really i this is this, i got more out of this conversation than i even could have ever imagined man it was really just <sighs> so, so beautiful speaking with you man and i think just you dropped some gems man and i really enjoyed it Thanks. hey in the fall in the fall let's talk again i have a book coming out a mystery a murder mystery in october called the unspoken it's on amazon and it's a series i'm creating because i love mysteries and thrillers oh this is my other book i gotta send you this too this is the ancient nine awesome. this is a thriller i wrote two years ago that's based on my experience in one of harvard secret societies but the unspoken i want you to read and then maybe in october we can talk about it I know you talk about health in your podcast, but Everything. if people want to venture down a different path, we could talk about the unspoken. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. All right. It's, it's, it's a lock, man. Definitely. Is that cool? <laughs> Just give, maybe we can let people know where to find you, man, on, on uh, social media. Oh, yeah. One more time. Yeah. Instagram is at Dr. Ian Smith. Spell the doctor out. I-A-N Smith. Blue mark. Check mark. Uh, my website is DrIanSmith.com. Spell the doctor out. My Twitter is D-R-I-A-N Smith. And if you want, if you like mysteries like I do, uh, I've created a mystery uh, um, uh, handle for my character, Ash Kane. So it's I am Ash, A-S-H-E, Kane, C-A-Y-N-E. Check it out. It's going to be a fun uh, Instagram for my character. All right. There it is. Thanks so much, Dr. Ian, man. We really appreciate you. Nice talking to you, man. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do this again in October, man. I appreciate you. Awesome. Be safe. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Mudgill podcast. The audio for this podcast can be found on Apple's iTunes and SoundCloud. Let's get it.